Welcome to the Desert Sanctuary with Carl and Laura Forehand. Often when we have doubts about religion, or we want to be contemplative, or simply ask questions, it can feel like we are wandering out into the desert. We would like to welcome you to our sanctuary, the Desert Sanctuary. We've tried to pick guests that resonate with our fellow friends and seekers here in the desert. Our hope is that you will find life for your body, soul, and spirit. And now, here is our show. Hi there. Welcome to the Desert Sanctuary Podcast. I'm Laura Forehand. I'm here with Carl, and it is a Sunday mid-afternoon. I don't know. Mid-morning. Church time. Mid-morning. Yeah, and we're not in church, so (laughs) there. But anyway, here we are doing a podcast, and yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting topic of conversation today. The Cowboys game comes on in four hours, so we have to be be done by then. I think we'll be done by then. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of football, yesterday was a good football day because Texas Longhorns won and the Sooners won. won. That's right. Now, we may not be able to record. And Nebraska lost. Yeah. We may not be able to record next weekend because it is the Red River, River Rivalry, which means one of us is going to be really sad. sad. Yeah, and probably, maybe me this year. Well. You guys are ranked higher. Yeah. Well, that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't always mean they're we've, a shoe in to win. We've really got into the college football. We've always, you know, you... Your grandpa and so on of all college, you, even your. I don't eight, know that it was college way way back then. It was more he was into professional football for sure, like New York Giants and the Jets and the Bills. Yeah. So you, your great aunts and mm-hmm. all they're ninety years old and eighty and ninety mm-hmm. years old and they're, they're when they came here to watch football it was a thing. Uh, they're they're into it. They don't understand the rules really or anything like that, but they that love it. That doesn't matter. They love it. <laughs> the rules don't matter. So we've kind of got into to the college football, but the the NFL still is just it's real hard to to get into that. I mean, you we know? don't watch it all day like we do college. No. Like we literally watch college game day and then watch we watch college till or watch football till. Probably like nine thirty last night. So that's so. eight. That's eight a.m. to nine thirty p.m. Almost ten. <laughs> no, it's like that's like twelve. No, thirteen and a half hours. Thir- yeah, I was going to say almost fourteen hours. Yeah, it's a Crazy. long time. Yeah, but today won't be like that. We just have a couple games, and depending on how well the Cowboys play, we may or may not watch the end to that that's game. Right. And then that's right. I'm a Kansas City Chiefs fan. Mainly because, as a teacher, like you kind of learn to be a Kansas City Chiefs fan, <laughs> so that you can wear jeans and a Kansas City Chiefs T-shirt, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So you learn to, you learn to like them, and so I do like them, and so that game comes on later tonight. But again, depending on if they're just really stinking it up, I'm not going to stay up to watch the whole right, thing. Right. So I, we're kind of fair lo- weather not a lot of loyalty. Yeah, we're kind of fair weather professional football fans it's almost so. like a bad parent either you, you do good and i'll like you Aww. don't <laughs> which we were not that we were way. not that way as parents but no. we are as football fans all right so let's get into the meat of today's topic what are we talking about so the the title is i wrote a blog not too long ago on pathos called why theologians and i've just there's another, you know, incident that's happened recently that I don't want to give any more air time to or mention the names again. But it has to do with theologians, mostly seminary professors. And um, it just has really got me thinking about theology and, you know, a lot of post-Christian things are not not anti-theist necessarily, but they're just anti-theology. They're just like, mm-hmm. let's not argue about this stuff we've been arguing about. Anyway, so the the title of the blog was Why Theologians? Mm-hmm. Kind of asking some questions about uh, why do we need these theologians? Mm-hmm. Um, where sometimes that's where the abuse happens. That's where um, they become a harbor for narcissists. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. and things like that. So, uh, do we really need that? Is that is that important to our future as we go on? And that's what we kind of wanted to wrestle with today, right? Yeah. So, let me. I'm going to start. You know, I have a list of questions here for you, but I guess my first question is. Can you like even define what a theologian is? I think it would be hard to do that, but I'm going to try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the, theology, to me, um, is trying to understand God, is study of God. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, theology, in the way we understand it in the 20th and 21st century, is t- tends to be mostly about our understanding of God based on the Bible. So it's it's that theology I saw your face there. <laughs> that so that either for or against or I have a literal interpretation, we believe in literal interpretation or well, there's another way to interpret it or well you're not interpreting it right. That kind of stuff. And so that that comes out most prominent for me with seminary professors, mm-hmm. um, the um, celebrity pastors, usually celebrity pastors are usually because they've got a unique take on how to interpret God through the Bible mm-hmm. and, you know, because of their different twist on it. Sometimes those can be good things, mm-hmm. you know, like when we learn about certainty and right. lack of certainty and so on, things like that. Um but it, but it tends to be seminary pa- seminary professors, uh, celebrity pastors, but to some extent that bleeds down all the way into every pastor, every person that writes a book about God. Mm-hmm. You know, some of that is still is still sort of theology. So. Yeah. Well, so do you think the profess profession? of like a professor or a pastor or priest, bishop, you name it, has accomplished anything significant like in the last 1,500 years? I mean, here's my thing. Like it just, I'm getting, I get tired just thinking about it because Mm -hmm. I just feel like all it is is this is my stance and I'm, you know, I've got my my fists up and I'm going to defend it. And that's, it just seems like there's just a lot of, turmoil because everybody's mm-hmm. trying to defend their position and it's like even though I'm we're not in it anymore just to think about that like mentally is exhausting to me mm-hmm. anyway so what do you think has any anything significant come of it in your opinion in the last 1500 years well the way the way I was thinking about that I was thinking about well, what if um, you know sometime let's say 40 50 years after Jesus died. Um, if th- the quote unquote theologians of that time would have said, you know, what I remember about him most of all is what he said love your neighbor, um, called the great commandment, mm-hmm. the golden rule, um, treat others the way it, you want yeah, to be. Yeah, treat it. others the way you want to I think a lot of times about what if we would have just stopped right there? Mm hmm. And said, okay, this is what we remember about Jesus. This was his message. This is what we should do. Um, I think we'd be a lot better off. Maybe that's too simplistic. And maybe that's, um, you know, just... um, Well, what did Jesus say about, like, all of the law can be summed up in what? Just I don't know the Bible. <laughs> in in those things, you know, love God and love your neighbor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and we have just muddied it. Yeah, I mean, made it so like ridiculously difficult. Yeah. So when, at some point, it become then became about well, but what do you believe? You know, I I think Jesus meant this, and I remember you know Paul said some stuff, and Peter said some stuff, and. And then these four guys wrote about what Jesus supposedly said, and they don't completely agree. But you know, then there's there's all this stuff. Well, what do you? But here's here's where it can't, where it kind of gets real for me. When I was being licensed as a pastor, mm-hmm. um, my pastor at the time was licensing me, so he was, you know, I'd been through some seminary and got a bachelor's degree, right, and so on, and he he wanted to train me, so he said. 
Carl, you know, one thing you might want to figure out is how you feel about peccability or impeccability of, of <laughs> Jesus. And I said, what? He, and he said, well, <coughs> we know Jesus didn't sin, but could he have sinned? Mm-hmm. Or couldn't he? You know, could he not have sinned? Right. Did he have the ability to sin? And so I remember real vividly studying that and forming an opinion, kind of reporting back to him. And he said, huh. And he didn't say whether I was right or wrong or anything like that. But I began right after that defending mm-hmm. my position. I would go up to people and go, well, what do you think about impeccability? And they go, huh? Oh, and I'd say, yeah. you know, this is why I think. And they're they're like, why do I care? Right. You know? I mean, is that going to help you love your neighbor any better? Yeah. And I think sometimes we can convince ourselves, well, we need to believe this way so that we can, we'll be better. Or you know, something. if anything, like just posing those questions can create division, in my mm-hmm. opinion. You know, if you go up to a church member and say, do you, you know, what do you think about peccability and impeccability and they're just like you know maybe they give you their opinion and it's different from you and then all of a sudden you know there's There's your division yeah Yeah, there's a debate there's a division so yeah i think you know at different points during history i would i always point to constantine you know when the empire joined back with the when when christianity joined back with the empire there, were, there was a need for, you know, having Bibles in our hands, having a canon of Scripture, and we needed to know what we believed. The creeds were developed, which we recite now, right? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people think well, we, we should just go yeah. back to just the creeds, <clears throat> then it would be okay. But it became about, do you believe the right things? Mm-hmm. Well, if you don't, and then, then you know, the Reformation and... You know, everybody said, well, just, we're just going to base it on Scripture. And then that became the paper pope. And the the problem is, you know, do you believe the right things if you don't? And, and so I think theologians, to a large extent, have, they're just cleaning up the messes of other theologians mm-hmm. that came before them. That was kind of... That yeah, might so have been they, the next question. Well, you know, that does lead us into the next question. So, like, are they really defining truth, or are they just addressing the toxicity of their predecessors? Yeah, and I think I think when you, so with the Jews in the first century, they thought, well, um, the law, it's the law, it's the law, it's the law. And if everybody would just obey the law. And I think we think, you know, I've discovered something new about God, if everybody would just believe like me. Mm-hmm. And one of the points I made in a post, I, I did a blog a couple of days ago, and I said, nature's not like that. A, a tree doesn't go, well, I'm trying to thrive and multiply and uh, flourish, <clears throat> right? Mm-hmm. I'm doing the best I can, and we know trees communicate with each other. Mm-hmm. But a tree doesn't ever say... To another tree, you should be exactly like me. Right. You know, and you should approach this exactly like I do. Those trees even help each other. You know, it's a love your neighbor situation. Mm -hmm. And I realize some things in nature eat each other, but so it's a little more complicated and they're not human beings. Right. But human beings destroy each other too, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's not always just to survive, or it's most often not just to survive. Sometimes it's because of beliefs that theologians have crafted. You know, it's this this belief, you know, that we need to, we need to thrive and other people aren't as important. You know, it's all kinds of different theological bents. Mm-hmm. And everybody always thinks they're right and God is on their side. Right, exactly. So why do we then put theologians in positions of power? Yeah, that's a good question. I know I'm when I originally posed that question. Why do we put them in power? And I think I think that it's um, it's you know we want we want to find the right answer. You know, I think yeah, we're always we're, looking for teachers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <coughs> I agree with that. I think though that then we 
have a tendency to shut off our own critical thinking, you know, and replace it with someone else's thinking, whether that's critical thinking or not. Yeah. You know, and I think <clears throat> that's where the danger lies. That's, um, you know, like in in the Bible, I remember them, you know, people were arguing. They were saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow John, you know, and they were mm-hmm. arguing about who their teacher was, and that was kind of a, a, a status thing for them. And I think, you know, it... It's, it'd make a lot of people mad if I say this, but <clears throat> to a large extent, the people on stage are the people that are entertaining. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're able to hold a crowd. Uh, they're entertaining. They present things in a challenging way. Mm-hmm. And and we, we kind of like that as people. We like to be uh, on that person's team <clears throat> because what they said moved us. We want other people to follow those same people. Uh, it's why we have celebrities, you know, in the entertainment industry is is real similar to why we have them on stage in a church. Yeah. I don't know. There's just something strange about that, even if it's just celebrities. Like, if we're just talking about celebrities, not celebrity pastors, you know, I just think it's it's an interesting dynamic of a human that, you know, we just fall prey to and, and idolize and worship these celebrities. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's interesting In to me. general. Yeah. yeah, in general. Yeah, because, I mean, for however long they're entertaining us, they we don't have to think for ourselves. Um, you know, we say, that resonates with me. That makes me laugh. Mm-hmm. That makes me think. Whatever, whatever it does. That's for us. okay, but it's like when we take it to the extreme. Mm-hmm. Like I don't think there's anything wrong with listening to a good speaker or a good comedian or you know whatever, um, or watching a good movie where you have very talented actors and actresses. But when we take it to that next level, mm-hmm. where you know we're we're putting them on this pedestal where everything they say and do you know is perfection Mm -hmm. i i don't know where that comes from in us but it can it it can be destructive really in a way the the person on stage most always has an external locus you know where they they need attention from strangers Mm. um would you say that was true about you when you were a pastor yeah i would say i that that definitely fed into it. It was an addiction. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd feel that rush from people approving of what you said or being moved by what you said. You hoped you were helping them, right? But you were mm-hmm. also kind of addicted to that in a certain way. Mm-hmm. And it is it is addicting. It's it's as much, you know, a rush for the speaker as it is for the other yeah. people. And a lot of times the people in the audience are people that want the attention the speaker is getting so they follow they volunteer they give up their time mm. they mm-hmm. help that person sell books whatever it is yeah. and there's a there's a little bit of that narcissist in all of us mm. you know mm-hmm. and i think it it kind of touches on her well i'd like to be important like they are mm-hmm. and so that it happens with celebrities, you know. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to be Taylor Swift, um, so and they enjoy her music, so they follow her. <coughs> yeah, well, I would I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I still think I'm, and maybe it's just my age, mm-hmm. but I'm just like, why? You know, I mean, I've done that too, but what I, like what why? I, yeah, what I was going to say a minute ago is. <clears throat> we've learned, I think, way more from listening to people's stories on our podcast. Mm-hmm. And when we listen to pe- people's stories, they will say, you know, for me, um, this is what happened, and this is what I experienced, and this mm-hmm. is how I approached it, and this is what I'm learning. Mm-hmm. That's a different thing than when you're on stage. When you're on stage... You're not just telling your story. 
you're saying this is this is what I think and this is what you should think in mm-hmm. a way. Yeah. You know, we don't they don't always phrase it like that. But when we listen to each other's stories, then I can be on a journey, I can tell you about my journey and you can tell me about your journey. And some of it resonates, some of it doesn't, some of it challenges us. But I think that's a more realistic way. I think that's more the way we were designed. We were designed to be storytellers and talk to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, if a church of 1,500 people were all talking and listening to each other, they'd be a lot healthier than if they're just all listening to the same narcissist. And that narcissism, um, when it's challenged causes all kinds of harm Mm -hmm. you know people get run over people get uh, seriously mentally harmed um, by the narcissist the toddler in charge Mm -hmm. we've talked about that before yeah you know i want to go back to something that you said earlier because you said you know a lot of kind of what you're writing and what we're talking about and even the people that were interviewing on the podcast you know are you know maybe could be categorized as survivors um of abuse religious abuse in Mm -hmm. particular so you know i you said i don't want to give any more airtime and i know what you're talking about like i know the specific incidents that you're talking about here but how can we how can we bring healing and light to the the narcissists or the abusers or whatever if we don't you know what i'm saying like a lot of people so <coughs> for example you know you've got like timothy mcveigh right he was the oklahoma city bomber mm-hmm. right and mm-hmm. and i just remember when that happened and then you know everybody was like or these school shootings and we're just like we got to stop giving you know the destructive people the airtime on the news and i i get that because Mm. that's what they want right Right. that's what they want but then how do you how do you bring light to a situation if you're not like looking at all aspects of it yeah you know if you're not looking at the the narcissists that are putting together conferences you know and things like that. As some people say, just take away their audience. But I think they'll always find an audience. Um, and I think that that someone has to advocate. And there's here's, here's my deal about advocating for people. You can't just say, I care about people. I had a discussion with a close friend recently. And they say, well... You know, the the person that was harmed needs to be he needs some healing, and I couldn't agree more. Right. <laughs> you know, they need some they need some healing, and they need to go inside and work on that. And I couldn't agree more. But there, you know, if you join a Facebook group and then it happens again, you know, or you see the same people in charge doing the same things, they're on the stage and they're affecting others. And it still harms you. And unless someone advocates for you or speaks up, mm-hmm. kind of puts their reputation on the line, you know, they speak up and they take the abuse, basically, is what happens. Mm-hmm. And it, somebody has to advocate, mm-hmm. you know, in the Me Too movement, uh, which was, again, against narcissistic, patriarchal mm-hmm. systems. And when they, in a lot of them, when they spoke up, they got destroyed. You know, they got run over. But but someone has to do that. They have to say, mm-hmm. "Wait a, you know, stop." And and no one wants to stop. The show wants to go on. The organization wants to thrive. Mm-hmm. It wants to keep going. And it's it's very it gets very angry, mm-hmm. <laughs> very quickly when something steps in the way of its profit or its success or Mm -hmm. its um, whatever that it loves. And, um, you know, I I think it takes all of that. It takes speaking up about it. It takes advocacy. 
mm-hmm. by other people. And, you know, we've, we've just got to challenge these leaders way more than we have in mm-hmm. the past. But it, to do that, you have to sometimes mention... You know, mm-hmm. you have to mention the things that they're doing that are still continuing to be destructive. That's right. You know, I mean, just finding the balance of making sure not giving them so much recognition because that's what they thrive on. Mm-hmm. And then also trying to remember those that have been victimized by them. I just, I think it's kind of an interesting dance to make sure that you're definitely you know, highlighting those that have been um, wounded or victimized Mm -hmm. um, more so than the narcissist because the narcissist, they're going to eat that up. They they love the attention, right? I mean, and I don't know much about narcissists in general, I guess, but I'm, I'm guessing, and maybe you would know the answer to this, that they, it's not just the positive publicity that they're getting but maybe even some of the negative publicity i mean it's just it's keeping them in in the forefront of the media or you know whatever yeah i i don't know if they they like it but i think they you know they like the positive results Mm -hmm. that sometimes it brings and um, well it may make them you know we were talking about like being in positions of power i mean it may make them somehow in some way feel more powerful yeah they're just jealous of me you know it's, right it's that kind of thinking right um they're just they just want the stage you know that's why they're criticizing us yeah and, yeah you know that happens a lot in christianity but yeah. I, all of that ignores you know all of all of that presupposes that you're famous or, or you're getting recognition mm-hmm. because you're superior to the other people Mm -hmm. and you know most speakers and so on say i don't know that's not what i think but that's kind of that's how they act Mm -hmm. you know that speaker may be an abuser you know but we can't hurt his feelings even though him being on stage is hurting lots of other people and you defending him you ignoring his abuse is hurting a lot of other mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. And it's it's saying, well, those people are less than, or what did what did Jesus, the Bible, say about the the least of these? Mm-hmm. You know, that was where our focus was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And while I say, well, I care about abuse survivors, but most times what they care about more is keeping their world mm-hmm. or the organization or the group or the whatever running and we just want to ignore that stuff Mm -hmm. as much as we can yeah and so and i mean i'm like super off script right now but Mm -hmm. like so you especially have had lots of conversations with people about you know certain topics that you know we may or may not give more airtime to but you know and something that you hear people say is you know well it doesn't directly affect me so why should i care Mm. i mean so how do you how do you speak to that yeah other than (laughs) it should uh, you know i many here's what's confusing to me um, many times a lot of the people a lot of people on stage are abuse survivors Mm mm-hmm and here's what you know people that are advocates and so on usually think about a lot is why is it that the abuse survivors that are in those type of positions Mm -hmm. tend to side with the abuser Mm -hmm. and give them much more grace Mm -hmm. and do you think that's many more chance yeah Yeah, yeah. something (laughs) i think it's got something to do with the whole christian dynamic of well we should forgive you know? Yeah, it definitely that that plays into mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. but also maybe you know it's well. If, let's say my father was abusive, mm-hmm. and my father wasn't really right. Um, but say my father was abusive, 
then maybe always hoped he's going to get better, right? Mm-hmm. And if we'll just go along, maybe he's going to get better and maybe I can have an influence on him, you know, mm-hmm. or something, or I could do things right. Yeah. And we'll help him, mm-hmm. you know. But Somehow you're going to be the savior. <laughs> right. And, and especially with, with narcissistic, you know, um, what am I trying to say? Personality mm-hmm. disorders. They, without a lot of really, really, really serious work, they don't mm-hmm. get better. Mm-hmm. And, especially, and the last thing they need is to be on on a stage, you know, feeding that, that right. chemical addiction they have. Right. <clears throat> well, I think, you know, the whole, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I want to say dialogue, and that's not right. But the whole Christian philosophy of... You know, forgiveness doesn't take into account or or that the, you know, well, we're just going to hold out hope that they can change. We always have hope mm-hmm. that they can change, you know. Um, I think it doesn't leave any room for boundaries. So mm-hmm. my thing is I can totally um, forgive my dad for things that happened in our in our childhood or even past in our adulthood let's see our son is 32 Mm -hmm. and so you know my dad hasn't spoken to me or my sisters in 30 years um not for lack of our trying Mm -hmm. um so i can i can forgive him for that and i use that word like carefully Mm -hmm. because i can forgive him for that but the boundaries of our relationship have dramatically changed Mm -hmm. and if he were to walk into my life today um it it would just be very different it's not that like i think about you our girls and you like you as their father your relationship and my relationship with my dad would not look the same at all you and say, I'm You're okay with now. that. You can, you can <laughs> yeah. babysit my son. No. Or, or <laughs> Our grandchildren, yeah. no. Like right. you have <clears throat> lost that privilege because you chose, that was your choice yeah. to, you know. Anyway, I digress. But I do think that, you know, the, the Christianese like bypasses so mm-hmm. much of that. They say what people say is they say wasn't there any redemption? Well, oh was, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have course, heard that. Of course, there's there is. Yeah. But what they need to do first is do something different for mm-hmm. a while until they're better, and you know until they've proven they're better. And and for a narcissist, a narcissist probably doesn't really ever need to be on a stage. It's mm-hmm. not the best place for mm-hmm. them. Even though they love it, you know, it's just mm-hmm. like an alcoholic with a with a beer, mm-hmm. you know, not that they can't be restored, mm-hmm. they can't be healed, mm-hmm. they, but they need to do something different than drinking mm-hmm. beer. Right, right. right. And so if, if you're addicted to people's yeah. applause, mm-hmm. then you'll lie, cheat, steal, ignore your family, do all kinds do of things. Do whatever you can to get that high. To get yeah. your high. Mm-hmm. And, and, and a narcissist doesn't need to be on stage. Yeah. And not all professors are narcissists, but it's the same thing as, you know, the, the Catholic priesthood and child molesters. It, mm-hmm. It's a harbor. Mm-hmm. And, and the stage in Christianity... Has has always been a harbor for narcissists. Mm-hmm. They they thrive well because they need that so mm-hmm. bad. Mm-hmm. I agree. <clears throat> okay, getting back on script now. Just you know, I, but I like going <laughs> off on tangents. For sure. I mean, because that just means that we're critically thinking about stuff. Yeah. So if theology and religion are really quests to understand God, why not stay on the quest or the journey and not view their findings? As final or definitive. Yeah, I see. That's what we're discovering. We're out here um, talking about our stories, to each other. We're finding healing and finding ways to heal. Mm-hmm. Um, we we also write books, you know, about our experience. Mm-hmm. We hope that helps somebody. Mm-hmm. But it's yeah, it's, it's dangerous to mm-hmm. stop and say, "Well, now I figured it out," because that's what people have done all throughout history. Right. 
You know, they've said, well, you know, your doctrine was wrong. Ours is better. We figured it out. So here's our creed. Um, here's our beliefs. To, and that, you know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of Protestant denominations because of that. Mm-hmm. But what, we, what we're discovering out here in the desert, kind of post-Christianity, past Christianity, or whatever you want to call that, is we're discovering that I can stay open. I can keep discovering mm-hmm. things. I can keep learning new things, and I don't. I can share that with somebody. I can write a blog. I can mm-hmm. write a book, but I don't have to stop there mm-hmm. and say, "Well, we've arrived, and now right. everybody come along with this." And and or how can I make some money from it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and I I think you know the, the danger is when it's well, this is this is my only option. You know, I need the applause of men. I need to sell a lot of books, or it's no, it's no good at all. Right, um, and that's a challenge for me. I think is like, well, how many people are reading our books? Well, what if just a few did, and it helped them? Right, is that good enough? Mm-hmm. If it's not good enough, it'll probably never be right good enough. Right, yeah. <clears throat> and that is, that is a, that's a struggle for all of us. Mm-hmm. In different aspects of our mm-hmm. life, right? Because, yeah. like, you pay attention to, you know, when we release a book, you know, you pay attention to that, those numbers and all that kind of stuff for a while. And for me, it's other things. So, we, yeah, I would agree with you. We all have our our, our things that we're, we but, have to, like, check every once in a while. But when you, when you step up on stage, especially when it's... Uh, full of people that are all white, all mm-hmm. men, and, you know, I say all, mostly white, male, straight. You know, when you step up into that position, it's it's more than just, you know, I want somebody to read my book. Mm-hmm. Now it's, I, I get something out of this, you know, and I am in a position of authority. Mm. And, and that position is a position of authority. So when people question a speaker that's up on stage that's in that position they're questioning the patriarchy mm-hmm. they're question they're questioning all that authority and all that um everybody that's on the stage with them mm-hmm. and so on so it's yeah. it's a big deal yeah so why why do you think there's so much abuse coming at the hands of these theologians and maybe you've already answered that question but why do you think there's so much abuse coming? Or, and maybe it was always there, you know? Mm-hmm. And we're just, like, the winds are shifting and we're starting to really see. I think a lot has been uncovered since 2016. Mm-hmm. I don't know. For me, that seems significant, you know, with Donald Trump and his presidency and then covid and just all that stuff i mean i think you know so many things have kind of been uncovered if you will but yeah you know i i I think that the harm comes because someone's someone's in charge their voice matters more than all of us they they have power Mm -hmm. they want us to pay them uh, they want us to volunteer for them mm-hmm. while we pay them. Isn't that funny? <laughs> it, yeah, we need to do a whole separate I just it, think thing that's about that. Interesting that we pay the church to work for them, so we can work for them for free. <laughs> and if oh you're my more, gosh! And more, we did it for so long. If you're more holy, you need to do more. I know. But mm. then, but then when you know something about that harms me. You know, mm-hmm. when when the organization comes first and I get left behind and I have trauma, or if their doctrine traumatizes me, when I try to speak up for it, then the immediate thing is to gaslight. Mm-hmm. You know, Carl, mm-hmm. you don't understand me. You don't know what mm-hmm. I think. You know, and it's it's all that kind of stuff that um, just gets heaped on to our trauma that we got. Maybe not originally from the church but that was compounded by the church mm-hmm. or compounded by speakers we're following 
and um, it's just you know in a way all that drama is what sells tickets which right. makes it even worse mm-hmm. <laughs> I agree so in the 21st century why do you think uh, this profession is still dominated by white male patriarchy I, I wish, you want my short answer yeah because I, racism I, is alive and well that's all I'm, yeah. I mean I just think it is I mean, again, if we go back to 2016, I just think it, it was probably already there, always there. Um, but, man. I, I have a thought, though. Okay. It may not go. be right. My, mine, is, mine, is a, mine is a super emotional <laughs> answer. My thought is because marginalized groups like people of color, mm-hmm. like LGBTQ people and women, uh-huh. when marginalized groups get in that arena i think they're more apt to tell the truth Mm. (laughs) about the organization yeah and so you guys you guys you know we were in a in a thing the other night and then the word woke came up and we started talking about how the woke word has been co-opted from black people Mm -hmm. and used Mm -hmm. in various different ways Mm -hmm. and wrong by the right Mm -hmm. and then in defense by the left, it's even been used wrong. But I, I think, you know, I just think that we we're perfectly happy. Let's just take progressives. Progressives are perfectly happy to stand on stage and rail against evangelicals. Mm-hmm. But what if what if a black person comes on stage? And rails against progressives, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, or says, "Listen, what what you're doing is you're um, you're abusing people." You know, mm-hmm. I, I think those group, those marginalized groups, when they get the power, are more apt to speak up about the abuses of power. Mm-hmm. And yep. power doesn't like to be told that it's abusing people. Even and, though they are, yeah, and somehow, I mean, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna bring it up. I know we're not Go ahead. giving them airtime or whatever, but you know, all, all the women that have spoken up regarding theology beer camp, mm-hmm. you know, and just the the main speaker there who has been or one of the speakers, one yeah. of the speakers, yeah, yeah. sorry. One of the speakers who, you know, is a known abuser. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know how many women spoke up. Hundreds, thousands, I don't know. But, and yet, it's still going to happen. You know, it's Mm -hmm. the, the theology beer camp is still going to happen. Yeah. And it's, it's so disheartening because when marginalized, you know, or, or people that have been victimized speak up and it's almost like the people in power don't, yeah. don't even want to say anything. Right. They would well, or they defend. Just, they defend the person who was abusive. But they would prefer not to say anything. Right. And and when you do that, you're re-traumatizing those yeah. people. Well, and you're supporting the abuser, in my opinion, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's where I struggle with people that are just like, well, it didn't affect me, so why should I care? And I'm like, and I mean, I wish well, we would go if- back and the whole, like, Christian thing. If we really, like, went back to Jesus, love your neighbor, mm-hmm. you know, then... When someone is traumatized and there's proof behind it, you know, or maybe you don't know the proof yet, but someone shares their story of abuse and, and a traumatic incident that happened, you know, shouldn't we love them enough to, you know, hear and believe their story? And I think what most people miss about the story is, well, what if that speaker, what if he's totally reformed? What if he's, you know done a thousand good things and he's better and he's well now but if that abuse survivor says to a group says to the leader of a group and the speakers that are speaking with him this traumatizes me because he's there Mm -hmm. and because you guys as part of that power structure are supporting him 
Yeah, that and, traumatizes me. Right. And, and this was supposed say, to be a well, safe space. And this is supposed to be you a safe space. You promised me this was a safe space. You were space. supposed to defend me yep. as the leader. And now you're not. And you're not. And they say that. That is re-traumatizing. Right. And, I hope people but, understand and, that. And when people dismiss that, mm -hmm. you know, then it, it causes more trauma. And that's the part that people this will quit trying to to cancel those speakers or punish those speakers. Well, the speakers are the people in power. They're the yeah. ones that are responsible mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. And they they could say if one of them, I think in the whole incident, if one of them would have said, "Listen, uh, I understand, and I really feel for you ladies in this group." that that have expressed this desire and i will forego speaking mm -hmm. you know or i'll just acknowledge publicly some of the, you know even just say anything right um most of them just didn't say anything they right. tried to talk and you know where they couldn't be recorded and things like that just reminds me of like homer simpson you know, when he's like standing in front of the bushes and he quietly backs mm -hmm. into the bushes so no one can see yeah. him. And I'm just like, that's what some of them did. Yeah. And you need to acknowledge if you did that. And then some of them just flat out defended the abuser. Right. And both of those things are so traumatizing or re traumatizing to people that have had their voices stifled you promised them a safe space to share their voice mm -hmm. and their experience and then when they did you absolutely ignored them or you yeah. defended the abuser right i don't understand i like here's my thing and then i'll get off this tangent but i don't understand what part of that people don't understand is re-traumatizing somebody right i anyway yeah it's it's hard to conceive of that and they say well you know i think it's you know it's the god complex sometimes of leaders that think well he'll be near us so we'll protect you by being <laughs> you know it, it's something i i you know i it's like you say a lot of it's hard just to unravel mm -hmm. but it's you know it's just the you can't expect me to give up my spot or you you know you can't expect me to and and all of them have talked to that person and got and got the the story from them but that is that doesn't help that that's not a gesture towards the the abuse survivors well and especially when you say well i talked to them and they assured me right well, of course they're going to assure you. What else are lie. they going to do? Yeah. Are they going to sit there and go, yeah, I was an abuser. And yeah, you know. I, anyway, yeah. it, it's mind boggling. But anyway, we've given enough air time to that. Yeah. So um, is the real unity among theologians the way they stick together and discredit anyone who points out their shortcoming or accuses them of abuse? Yeah, I think... Because once what what they tend to do is group together, like maybe one of them's open in relational theology. Okay, these are all of our people, mm -hmm. right? Or this is progressive. This is all of our people. Or um, I'm we're, so tired of labels. We're the, I'm just yeah, saying. we're the emergent church, so we're all speakers from that. That's during the emergent church in 2015. That's why a lot of um, uh, women didn't speak up mm -hmm. for the abuse and so on. anyway but we're we're this group so we're the southern baptists we're the and so our speakers you know at our camp are we're gonna we're gonna tend to protect them mm -hmm. circle the wagons yeah because we've worked so hard to build this organization right. or, or publishing company right. or whatever you know, we've worked so hard to get this together. And so, you know, who are you, an outsider, a mere peasant, you know, or whatever, <laughs> however they think I of mean, that. I mean, really. You're, you're, you know, you don't even know me, so you can't, you know, but there's there's no gesture to So funny, you don't even know me. But yet, the amount of people that 
have like attacked you for standing up for abuse victims. Right. You know, act like they Who know don't you. Know me. <laughs> I know it. Who don't know but you? But certainly, they said what they say is, I can tell you've had a lot of trauma, and so you've been deeply wounded. I can tell that, and I'm sure you. And just- then you should care. I mean, as what I want to say to those people, then you should care. I Okay, I'm just going to say to our listeners that when I first started this podcast this morning, I was like, I just don't have any energy. And now I am like it's so fired freaking up. fired up right now. It's just like, ugh. It just irritates me. Like, it's probably it, it's, because I'm sorry, but you- that's gaslighting for somebody to go, oh, you you sound like you've had a lot of trauma yes, and you're probably still dealing with morning. trauma and i'm just like f you is what i want to say <laughs> like for coming at me like that you should if i am traumatized you as a christian should care and not add to that by sitting there and gaslighting me yeah oh man yeah, it's, i don't know it's it's infuriating but this is why i just like cannot call myself a christian i just feel like there's so much gross baggage connected to that label i mean i really don't even have a label for myself and i'm fine with that like i'm just trying to be the best human being i can be i had someone this morning write six paragraphs in messenger and then tell me to stop oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> that makes sense. You just you just, you just wrote railed six, on yeah. me for five paragraphs, yep. and then you said stop. But that's basically I what have, happens have, when final we can... Yeah, yeah. You know? Okay. So, final question I have for you. When we, when we came to understand love your neighbor... I'm not sure that we have come to understand that. Right. But when we came to understand love your neighbor, why didn't we stop there? Yeah, and first of I all, don't think that we understand it if we can't stop there. Right. And first of all, Laura's not questioning me because I have all the answers, but just as a way to get conversation started. Right. Um, yeah, I think, like I mentioned before, I think we should have stopped because, you know, some of those things in other faiths and other uh, practices are like that, you know. Mm. Um, like existence, consciousness, and bliss. That that simple thought, you could think about that for for years or hundreds of years mm-hmm. and, and still draw things from it and so on. I think love your neighbor is one of those things that, you know, a lot of times you wear shirts about kindness, mm-hmm. which, you know, essentially is love, right? Mm-hmm. And you just just be kind, you know? Like, it shouldn't matter, you know. Okay, well, let me turn this back on you then, because now I've got this. So, people might say to you, well, why don't you, why can't you just be kind to that speaker at Theology Beer Camp? Why can't you just be kind to the, the you know, the person who's showing narcissistic tendencies? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, that's my question. To yeah, you. It's, that's. <laughs> I mean, because I just feel like you know, people always have a comeback. They always have. So why, you know, where's your kindness? Maybe someone might say to you. Yeah, and I say, um, someone's got to speak up. Mm. And I, I try not to ever be unkind. I feel like you speak up with kindness. And I don't, I don't ever rail on somebody, mm-hmm. or but when I say it d- directly. Um, they don't experience that as kindness. No, yeah. Um, you know, I could say, you know, why, you know, why did you just, you know, why are you still supporting mm-hmm. this? And I speak up about yeah. that. They don't, if I speak up about that, that's not, that doesn't seem like kindness. Mm-hmm. But it is loving your neighbor because there's people being abused and harmed mm-hmm. that can't get out of it. and. And they've tried to speak up, right? And there, there's people. So there's there's people that have been through the emergent church and, and some things like that. Mm-hmm. That in 2023 still won't talk about it mm-hmm. because the whole culture was so toxic mm-hmm. and wounded them so badly that. They they refuse to talk. They might feed you a little bit of information, mm-hmm. 
but they don't want to talk about it and be re-traumatized right. by it. Right. So uh, someone has to speak up for mm-hmm. them. Someone that has a little energy left. Yeah. You know, that's been run over before, too. Right. But just has a little energy to say, would you guys please think about what you're doing? Yep. Would you please just be honest with people? Mm-hmm. Um, and the show doesn't matter. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. I, I know you've worked hard, just like the rest of us have worked hard, mm-hmm. you know, for right. whatever we've accomplished. Right. But the show doesn't have to go on, mm-hmm. and that may, that may be, you know, this, the fact that the show doesn't go on, need to go on is something every church member needs to consider. Everyone that puts on concerts, everyone that puts on shows, it it doesn't have to go on. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because, well, you know, you were talking about this thing that we went to last Wednesday night and a pastor was there speaking um, who was the victim of basically hate (laughs) and um, it was interesting because he even said you know churches are not full anymore Mm -hmm. they're they're not you know standing room only anymore and I think there's something to be said about that what i got from him he's he just looks so tired yeah like like he's you know because he keeps getting attacked yeah and he just and it's by mostly by the patriarchy Mm -hmm. maybe it's evangelicalism but it's not always evangelicalism it's some it's some sometimes what we're seeing is just that stuff is mutated Mm -hmm. into any organization any Anyone, anyone that has a stage. And I just want to say one more thing about the word kindness. So kindness is not ignoring victims. No. That's not, or staying silent when you see um, people being abused. That That's not showing kindness. Just because you don't say something ugly, uh, you know, about the person on stage who shouldn't be because it makes you uncomfortable doesn't mean it's not not kind right it it makes you uncomfortable for a reason (laughs) and just because it makes you uncomfortable doesn't mean it's not kind um my daughter and i had to have a conversation the other day wasn't because i was right and she was wrong or anything like that we just needed to communicate because if if we didn't and and so that was uncomfortable. Yeah. And she might have needed to tell me some stuff I didn't want to hear. I needed to tell her some stuff she might not have wanted to hear, but we communicated. And so to me, that's kindness. Oh, for sure. Because otherwise, you've got this story you've made up in your head. She's got this story she's made up in her head. And typically, you know, especially when there's some sort of a grievance, those stories that we're making up aren't very kind, right? Mm-hmm. We're were I mean I know I'll speak for myself you know I have a tendency to attack people in my mind and so that's you know not showing kindness so well this has been a good conversation but yeah. of course now I'm now you're revved I, uh, up now I'm revved up <laughs> <laughs> but that's good I mean because I don't think I don't think we can move forward unless you know we have a little fire underneath us yeah and, and, and i would just say you know i don't i don't suppose any any narcissistic people are going to be listening to our podcast but if if they do you know i would say your natural tendency is going to be to hate somebody who's advocating mm. for someone else mm-hmm. because you know they're making a big deal about something mm-hmm. and you're going to you're going to see them as Toxic. You're going to see them as all kinds of things, but maybe consider what what they're doing really is kindness. It, mm-hmm. It's really that they're putting their reputation, they're putting their um, mental well being, and all kinds of things on the line for some person that mm-hmm. can't speak up for themselves or doesn't have a voice. And I should, I, I would just say to you that you should know that. You mm-hmm. should know that you're just reacting. Mm-hmm. You're not. You're reacting out of your own pain or whatever. Right. So, right. Right. Um, 
what you're accusing other people of. Yeah. And and, and I also want to acknowledge that we're not talking about this because we're perfect, uh, that we, all along the way, we write books. We have spoken, to, you know, for 20 years I was a pastor. So we know, you know, how those things get created. Mm-hmm. We know that we've been narcissistic at times. Mm-hmm. We know that we've hurt people uh, unintentionally. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying it's we all need to start talking about it. We can't do the Homer Simpson whenever something comes up. We can't gaslight, just gaslight whoever brings it up mm-hmm. or punish them so we won't feel like they're punishing us. Um, we we got to get it together somehow. And, and I think that if people ask the question, like, why are you supporting this known abuser take a breath and really mm. evaluate yeah. why am i yeah most you know uh, i mean I, there there's nothing wrong in self evaluating why you're doing something yeah and take more than a day yeah to think about it <laughs> yeah i mean there's nothing i mean i think for me especially as an educator when i finally learned to reflect on the day what went well what didn't go very well it made me a better educator because it's like, I don't want to do, you know, that did not work the way I approached that situation. And I don't, I don't want to feel this way anymore. So I need to evaluate what I can do differently next time. Yeah. Yeah, this has been good. I appreciate you doing this. And now you're, now you're fired up. So now I can't take a nap this afternoon. <laughs> well, Just kidding. It'd be good for watching football. Yeah, It'd I guess good. so. And, as always, want to thank you for tuning in. As always, be where you are, be who you are, and be at peace. Thank you for joining us today on the Desert Sanctuary. Remember, all that wander in the desert are not lost. We hope that you know you are seen, you are heard, and you are loved.